Hello everyone. Today we want to be talking about invertebrates. So just as the disclaimer, I apologize in advance if I mispronounce any of these clade names or any of these species names. Um, it's not my intention to do so. Okay, so let's just get right into it. So this is the phylogenetic tree that we're going to be taking a look at um, for this video. We're going to be taking a look at the metazoan clade, the eumetazoan, the bilateria, and in particular the protostome um, branch of the bilateria clade. The deuterostomia uh, clade is going to be left for a later time and won't be included in this video. Alright, so let's just get into it. So the metazoa clade includes all animals, whether or not they have true tissues or symmetry present. The eumetazoa clade are animals that have true tissues as well as some sort of symmetry present. Bilateria is an even more specific clade in which the organisms have specifically bilateral symmetry and are triploplastic. The protostomia branch, the branch that we're going to be taking a look at, um, has particularly protostome development, while the deuterostomia branch will have deuterostome development. So let's start with periphera, which is part of the metazoa clade, but not the eumetazoa clade. And that's because the periphera, or sponges, are organisms that don't have true tissues or organs. They are sedentary, which means that they don't move around. They can be found in either fresh or marine water, and these organisms are essentially suspension feeders. So they use their coanocytes, or collar cells. Um, these collar cells, or coanocytes, beat their flagella in order to create water currents. These uh, currents draw in water, and with the water comes in some nutrients that go through the sponge's pores. As it comes through, uh, the nutrients come through the pores, they are essentially filtered out from the rest of the unwanted material and taken into the cells through phagocytosis. Amoebocytes take in these nutrients and distribute them to the rest of the sponge. And the figure on the right is um, a, di uh, a diagram of one type of periphera. Okay. The next clade we're going to take a look at is the eumetazoa clade. So specifically, we're going to be looking at the cnidarians of the eumetazoa clade. These cnidarians can be either sessile or motile, but in both forms, they are diploblastic with a radial body plan, and they have a gastrovascular cavity that is lined with tentacles. So in this case, if you look at the figure on the right, on the left of the figure is the polyp form. And this form is the sessile or the stationary form. On the right is the medusa form. And the medusa form is the mobile form. These are the organisms that are able to move around and search for food in order to survive. The sessile form, the polyps, belong to the class Anthozoa, while the motile medusa form belongs to the class Medusazoa. Now, some Cnidarians are able to switch between the polyps and the medusa form, um, but we're going to be taking a specific look at the anthozoa, which are organisms, the cnidarians, that are only present in the polyp stage, and the uh, class medusazoa are the cnidarians that predominantly live in the medusa stage. But it's important to remember that there are some organisms that are able to change between both forms. So now we're going to take a look at the bilateria. So again, just as a reminder, these bilaterias are uh, part of the larger clade eumetazoa and also the even larger clade, the metazoa clade, or the metazoa domain. All right. So we're going to look at, uh, take a look at the protostomia, um, specifically the protostomia branch, and these organisms have bilateral symmetry, they are triploblastic, and they have protostome development. So just as a reminder before we get into it, protostomes are organisms that have its mesoderm split into two to form its coelom. 
They are spiral and determinate at the eight cell stage of development, and the blastophore that forms eventually develops into a mouth instead of an anus. So in this lophotrophozoa stage, or sorry, clade, there are different uh, subclades. So let's take a look at the cindermata first. So for cindermata, there are two types of organisms that are classified under this clade. There's the rotifer, an image of uh, one is shown on the right. These are free living animals. They have their own digestive system developed or a, an alimentary canal uh, that's present in these organisms. Another organism um, that belongs to this clade is the acanthocephalin organisms, and these are essentially parasites. They still do have a digestive system. The only difference is that these digestive systems are going to be more re reduced and uh, less developed, but still present um, when compared to the, uh, the rotifers. The next uh, smaller clade, the subclades, is the lophophorates. lophophorates. These uh, organisms have ciliated structures or lophophore nets that they use to essentially capture food. They are filter feeders and sessile, similar to uh, the periphera, the sponges that we have uh, talked about earlier. So in the image on the right, it uh, might help clarify how these organisms uh, live. Essentially what happens is they are sensile in the sense that they don't move around in their environment. They stay in its place. However, they are able to extend and spread their ciliated structures, their lophophore nets, to be able to capture food as it rocks around, moves around. Uh, this net moves around, but its uh, structure in its core stays the same. Then once it has captured something, it closes and withdraws into its environment and begins to uh, take in its nutrients and spread it to its cells. Forms of these uh, organisms, or types of these organisms, include the ectoprotes and the brachiopods. Okay, so the next clade we're gonna go to is the platyhelminthi clade. These organisms are essentially flatworms. So they need water to survive. They live in mostly aqueous environments. Um, these organisms are triple blastic acelomates. They don't have a circulatory system, but they do have a gastrovascular cavity that is able to distribute food to um, its cells. It, uh, these organisms are called flatworms because they are flat. <laughs> they are, th their flatness allows for a greater surface area. Uh, which helps in gas exchange. Since these organisms don't have a circulatory system, their uh, surface area really matters. Examples of these, uh, these organisms are planarians. So an, an image is shown on the right, or the top right. Um, these organisms have light-sensitive eye spots, as you can tell on the right of the organism, those black dots. And uh, ganglia and ventral nerve cords, as well as a mouth um, that indicates some sort of cephalization uh, present in these organisms as well. The next clade we're going to go to is the mollusca. So these organisms are essentially mollusks. They have snails, slugs, oysters, clams in these clades, as well as octopi and squid. So these organisms have a soft body with a hard shell. Um, there's a muscular foot present, which is used for movement or adhesion, um, a visceral mass or organs, um, a mantle that's used for protection or the production of a hard shell, as well as a mantle cavity in some cases that is usually filled with water, and um, rat radula, which are like teeth around the mouth to help with um, hunting. There are separate sexes. Um, present in these organisms, so there is the ability to sexually reproduce. A uh, type of mollusca is the cephalopod. 
plate, I guess. So these cephalopods are organisms such as squid, octopi, cuttlefish, and these organisms have a closed circulatory system. They have a complex brain and beak-like jaws, which are surrounded by tentacles, which can be thought of as a modified muscular foot. The next clade that we're going to take a look at is the Annelida clade. So the Annelida clade are composed of essentially earthworms and leeches. There's still some cephalization happening here. There's a ganglia and sensor sensory structures um, developing. There's a complete gut and there's these organisms are essentially coelomates. They have longitudinal and circular muscles that allow for these organisms to control where they're moving. And um, as you can see in the image, there are fused rings. So the body of these organisms have very distinct rings uh, around them. These organisms also have a closed circulatory system, uh, which allow for effective long distance transport of materials as these organisms can get fairly large. So these are the clades for the Lophotrophozoa. Now we're going to move on to the Ecdysozoa. So the Ecdysozoa actually has eight phyla, but we're only going to go over two of them in this video, the nematodes and the arthropoda. So in both clades, there is a tough and hard outer coat. Uh, usually we call it either a cuticle or an exoskeleton. Uh, an exoskeleton is when the coat is um, more hard and uh, solidified and strong, while the cuticle is um, just the outer coat can be uh, protective, but it's less um, sturdy. These organisms, uh, the ecdysozoa organisms, are able to grow through ecdysis. ecdysis. Uh, which is essentially molting. They shed their hard outer coat, their cuticle or exoskeleton, they shed that in order to grow um, in size as the cuticle or exoskeleton reforms. So for the nematodes, that's how we're going to start off. The nematodes are essentially roundworms or, uh, or they're, they're thread-like and they live in aquatic environments. They have a thick but soft cuticle not a exoskeleton, but a cuticle. There's an alimentary canal present, and there's no closed circulatory system. These organisms have a pseudocelum. Instead of an actual coelom, they have a pseudocelum. Their body wall muscles uh, are longitudinal so that they are able to move around. And these organisms are actually very highly uh, sexually reproductively active. They're able to lay about 100,000 eggs per day. Um, these nematodes can be parasitic and they can be decomposers in uh, environmental niches. The second clade we're going to take a look at is the arthropoda. So the arthropodas are essentially like arthropods. They undergo tagmosis in which uh, different regions are uh, fused together, so they're segmented, uh, but they come together in uh, specified regions. So um, these arthropod, arthropods, excuse me, these arthropods have joint appendages uh, that form due to its thick exoskeleton, which are made out of protein and chitin. So chitin is a sort of polysaccharide that is used to just uh, reinforce the exoskeleton and make it more rigid and able to withstand pressures, environmental pressures. So cephalization um, is also present in these arthropods. They have compound eyes, antenna, and some mouth parts, um, as opposed to a closed circulatory system in which there are specific pass passageways for blood to flow. Uh, arthropoda have uh, open circulatory systems in which hemolymph it's a type of fluid that is going to, uh, is pumped throughout the organism uh, as a form of uh, circulation of nutrients and uh, 
resources. Uh, again, arthropoda has an exoskeleton, and this exoskeleton is used primarily for protection, but there's also um, roles that the exoskeleton uh, has in preventing water loss, in just support, as well as uh, precise muscle movement and attachment. And again, because these arthropods are part of the ecdysozoa clade, they have to undergo molting in order to grow. So the exoskeleton actually limits in its size uh, of these organisms. So the first uh, clade that we're going to take a look at uh, within the arthropoda is the chelicerata. So the chelicerata is, in, uh, is composed out of uh, scorpions, spiders, ticks, and these are part of the class arachnida or arachnids. So these organisms have six pairs of appendages. And the most anterior, the most uh, towards the front, is are th called the chelicerae, thus the name of the clade chelicerata. So the chelicerae are essentially like claw-like appendages in front of the mouth. Um, sometimes they're poisonous, but they're not always poisonous. They're essentially used to help these organisms feed. Uh, these organisms also have book lungs for gas exchange and they are able to produce silk, which is essentially like a liquid protein. Now, if you think of about spiders and how they produce silk, silk is used for capturing prey, nesting, defense, and migration in the sense that they can use silk to build nests, to, sorry, to build webs and uh, nets and gliders and all of that uh, in order for it to survive. The next uh, clade we're going to take a look at is the Myriapoda. So poda often refers to feet, so just keep that in mind as we continue on. So the Myriapoda undergoes tagmosis as well, and this tagmosis allows for a head region and a trunk region. So for the Diplopoda, which are essentially millipedes, there are two pairs of legs per trunk. Dip, uh, sorry, di, meaning two, and poda, feet. So there's two pairs of feet, two pairs of legs per trunk. As you can see in the image um, on the top, there are, for each little segment that you see, each distinct segment you see, there are two pairs of legs. As opposed to the chilopoda or the centipedes, the one pair of legs per trunk, you can see on the image how each of these little regions on the torso, the trunk, have only one pair of legs. Thus, it's a uh, name. Okay, to move on. The next clade is the hexapoda. These are insects. So undergoing tagmosis, what happens is that there's going to be a head region, a thorax region, and then an abdomen region. So these insects, as all of the insects that I'm sure you've seen in your life, they have two pairs of wings and three pairs of legs. There's a tracheal system present in these organisms that allows for gas exchange. These organisms, hexapoda, are able to undergo metamorphosis in order to complete its life cycle. There are two forms of metamorphosis. There's the complete metamorphosis, in which the organisms undergo a complete change from a larval to a pupa to a, an adult stage. A common example of this would be the caterpillar to the um, cocoon to the butterfly. The second form of metamorphosis, the second type, I should say, is the incomplete metamorphosis. And this type of metamorphosis is when the young organism is essentially the same as the adult organism, only smaller. So a common example of this would be the grasshopper. So these grasshoppers, once they're born, they're very tiny. They shed the egg dice, egg dices, or they molt their exoskeleton, and they grow a little bit in size, and they continue to do this until they reach maturity. So that's uh, the clade hexapoda. The next clade we're going to take a look at is the crustacea or the crustacean clade. 
So undergoing tagmosis, what happens is that these organisms have a cephalothorax region and an abdomen region. These organisms usually have two pairs of antennae. One of these pairs are usually a lot longer than the other pair. Um, there are three types that we're going to take a look at. There's the isopods, which can be found um, terrestrially in fresh water or um, in marine water. Uh, these examples of these are pill bugs. Um, the next example, or sorry, the next type of organisms are the decapods. So deca, 10, pods, legs. These organisms have 10 legs and are thus pretty large in size compared to the others. So these are uh, organisms like lobsters and crabs. The next uh, type of crustace crustaceans are the copepods. Cope these organisms have are essentially smaller planktonic microorganisms, and they have a very uh, large role, a very fundamental role in food webs, in um, their environment. So these examples of these are like krill, in which uh, they're eaten by smaller uh, primary uh, predators, which are then um, preyed upon by larger predators, and so on and so forth. Um, so they essentially form the basis of the entire uh, ecosystem. Okay, so that is the uh, clades under arthropoda. So let's go to back to the tree. So these are the organisms within arthropoda. Arthropoda is one of the clades within the ecdysozoa. Ecdysozoa is one of the clades within the protostomia. The protostomia is a clade within the bilateria, and the bilateria is a clade within the eumetazoa as well as the metazoa clade. So just to recap, we're gonna take a look at this tree once again. Um, just as a tip for you guys to study, I suggest that you guys go over this tree, hand draw it, and label all the clades in these organisms that we uh, had gone over, as well as identifying characteristics that define each clade, as well as the, the characteristics that are specific and unique to particular organisms uh, and particular species. This would help you uh, form connections and identify the relationships between each clade and allow you to really understand and grasp how everything uh, is related to one another. If there are any questions, feel free to visit um, SI office hours or rewatch this video. I hope this helped. Uh, thank you for your time and um, yeah, I'll see you all soon. Thank you.